Welcome to The Conversation, a podcast about technology, instructional design, and the learning sciences. In this episode, you will hear the students who have listened to last week's case study from Clara responding to the two questions that she posed. First, I'm going to replay an excerpt from last week's episode where Clara poses her questions, and then I will play the students' responses in turn. So there is a general problem that I always deal with, which is how to promote more interaction among students in online discussions. So I see that a rookie mistake with this is, oh, if I have a good question, it will generate discussion. So I'm seeing some instructors do this right now, where they use any kind of forum, voice, or written forum. They pose a good question, and then that's it. And they expect that the students will interact and, and generate discussion, right? And uh, mm. that, that often doesn't happen because we've seen that because most students, they will still see that as a kind of um, assignment. We see that students just post something and they leave mm-hmm. and don't engage in a conversation. The second problem is I have an online class with 28 students. What I'm struggling with is uh, the setup of a a good discussion because since there are so many students in the class, it becomes overwhelming the amount of uh, responses and comments and things that they have to do. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I'm struggling with is how to divide them into groups, how to make sure that the groups are interacting and having an authentic, productive discussion while they also have Uh, access to other groups and other peoples outside of the group, small group Mm -hmm. um, discussion. How do I make these heterogeneously enough and change them frequently so that they keep hearing from each other, but not just that small group, right? Because I think there's a benefit for hearing from everyone as well. So that's a more specific problem that results from the first problem. Hi everyone, this is Jack Esposito and I am a graduate student at Adelphi University and currently getting my master's in adolescence education with my content area in mathematics. So the main issue of this case appears to be that there's a difficulty with getting students engaged in meaningful and interactive discussions, specifically in an online setting. I want to note that what both of you said about prompted questions is often, not, I agree that it's often not the problem. Um, A professor's question typically already acts as an essential question, and the questions encapsulate the big ideas that cover the necessary, deeper, higher level type of thinking from a reading or a whole curriculum. However, it seems that students are still more likely in an online class to just respond to the prompt and reply to each other just to get the credit and be done with it and not contribute again or come back to it and form a scholastic ongoing conversation, one with insight and analysis. And on top of that, it's also very difficult to manage every student's progress and participation and to make sure that everything they're doing is meaningful and contributing to the class's cause, especially when trying to use grouping strategies with students. So my recommendation is that um, is to give students something to work towards in terms of their participation, rather than just offering participation as a week-by-week separate discussion. Um, I know the goal of all the of a course and the readings are really to inspire students to create their own meaningful final artifacts or products like a research paper or a unit plan. However, my proposal is to create an end product to the participation portion of a class. So instead of typical weekly diverse participations, there could be an assignment offered like participation projects. Um, and I would love for it to be revolved around a student's creative idea. So the, the specifics of the project, of course, depend on the course, but it would hopefully be something based on a student's original thought, and that could be applied to the course as well as their future and life goals. Um, so coming up with an assignment like this does take work and dedication, but it would give the students a goal to work towards in terms of weekly discussions, and it would give them ways to try and connect Uh, weekly content in relation to their project. So students are now reflecting on readings, responding in a meaningful way, and connecting it to something that's educational and interests them, their idea, so to speak. As I've also always felt that a difficult part of a major assignment is finding research itself. So collecting sources all year like this and having students 
create their own interpretations of these sources is beneficial to them and helps them engage with content and participation. So then going off of this, you can have students respond to each other's reflections and connections and actually offer feedback to each other based on project proposals, kind of like a mini cohort in a sort. Um, I always found that students really do like actually like helping each other out when they're capable of doing so. So they can offer their opinions to their peers' discussion and ideas, uh, reflect, and it's a great way to encourage a back and forth conversation um, about things that actually interest the students. So I feel like this type of idea actually has the backing from the six facets of understanding reading, especially the can apply and have perspective facets, because they outline how a student truly understand something when they can use it and adapt it in a new setting, as well as hear the points of views of others on the same thing. So this project itself is application because students are applying something to, applying readings to their ideas for concentration and perspective in the feedback portion where students are reflecting on each other's ideas and perspectives and points of views. And one last thought on the grouping difficulties I feel like something that could be useful would be to group students in a way where everyone hears from each other at least once in terms of feedback. This is kind of like the idea of constructivism, where students are creating their own meaning and thought from the curriculum, especially from their prior knowledge and personal experiences, and are discovering concepts themselves based on the guidance of peers or a professor. So, which is kind of social constructivism. But overall, I just feel like this project idea would make students want to participate, give them something tangible to work towards, and the professor can grade it throughout the year as well as through an end product. Hi, my name is Nicholas Brown, and I'm currently enrolled in Adelphi's Educational Technology uh, graduate program, and I am in my first semester. So, after listening to your podcast, it seems that there are two case studies to discuss, but they are related and similar. So for the first case study, it appears that um, basically you are trying to figure out how to get past the initial discussion question once it's posted to generate uh, a fluid conversation. So some of the, the recommendations that I have are to try and relate the question that's being posed to the students so that it engages them and it's a bit easier for them to um, discuss it and possibly generate some good ideas to um, help a, a conversation, you know, occur. You could possibly make it mandatory for students to respond to uh, a few comments so that a conversation is guaranteed. You could make an incentive for students to post and respond to a certain number of um, comments so that you may possibly make it mandatory for them to respond to one comment and anything past that, like a second or third or fourth response, could possibly be extra credit or a power up or a boost or, or something like Professor Hung does. Could possibly switch it up and not always have students respond to a discussion question or conversation. Maybe give them options to demonstrate that they've learned from the reading or the lesson you provided them by letting them write or make a video or create a podcast episode, something different that engages them. And we talked about that in week seven when we were addressing uh, the UDL. So for part two, it's a little bit of a more detailed problem. It seems that you have an online class with 28 students. It's a uh, with a setup of discussions and you feel a little bit overwhelmed of how you want to divide them into groups and know how to monitor their productivity and how they other groups can work and, and view their work. So a solution I have would be to possibly give your class a personality survey and have this survey touch on a few different areas. Um, it could ask students about their academic preferences, um, their personalities, and their personal interests. Now, based on the results of this survey, you could possibly form a group, um, seven groups of four, or four groups of seven, whatever size you want to have the groups. These groups were based on the results of this class so that the students in the groups are relatable and they should be cohesive and work together fine. 
Now, these groups um, can collaborate and start and name their own podcast, have, you know, give them some freedom and flexibility, where they could, as a group, discuss uh, the current topic of the week. And after they post and discuss uh, the topic, they can collaborate again as a group and listen to another group in the class podcast and comment on it, you know, touching on some key points that they made and providing the group with some feedback about how they did. Uh, This may not uh, be an example where I provided 17 different solutions, but I think the solution I provided um, was good. And I think it's good because I feel it addresses all of your problems. You want to um, place students in groups and students are now in groups where they should all be enjoying themselves and work cohesively together. They should work well based on that survey. You can monitor monitor their work um, by listening to their podcasts. So you can now see and listen to their work and see how they work together, what they discuss, all that. And you can now have students view other students' work by listening to another group's podcast. So I think that all of your areas were covered. And I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast. Hi, this is Gabriella Gardino. I'm a senior at Adelphi studying TESOL, and I'm certified in special education and regular education birth through sixth grade. Um, The problem that I think in this case study, in my own words, is um, that you're not sure how to promote more um, discussions amongst the students. You pose a question and they answer, but they're not um, necessarily holding a discussion back and forth with each other. So I feel that some solutions to this can be to have make participation required and have it added into the final grade at the end and make that clear in the beginning of the semester. Maybe tell your students that they, um, if somebody answers back to them, they must keep the conversation going and, 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 and discuss with them as well. Um, I also believe incentives and extra points, um, should be awarded to the students to keep the conversation going. This is uh, called gamification, and we do that in our class. Um, We have power-ups and boosts and things like that if we continue the discussion going on with our um, peers. I also think that um, maybe to provide guidelines for construction conversations constructive conversation so in the beginning of the semester and each assignment um, provide the guidelines of what you want the student to do and um, maybe give them a number of times that they should interact with their peers and and hold discussions with their peers um, requiring the students to respond to a peer and then if the peer responds back then it should be required that that student answers them back and they're having the conversation and keep the conversation going. And I think that voice thread discussion questions are very helpful in our class. And um, a lot of the time we get notifications. um, Well, I get notifications on my email if somebody responded to one of my posts or one of my answers to the question. So it's that's another good way to... um, be able to know right away if someone wrote back to you without having to check all the time. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Snyder. I'm studying art education at Adelphi University. I think the the main issues being addressed in the podcast are how to generate a good conversation in an online forum and how to set up discussion groups with a large class. Uh, generating good conversation, I think it helps that the students all have uh, fairly diverse backgrounds. They have different ways of looking at things, uh, so they bring a wide range of ideas to the class. Um, it helps if the professor is active with the class, uh, kind of like instigating. Uh, some uh, student makes a one post, maybe the, the professor comes in and, and uh, adds on to the idea or tries to contradict it to see who else might respond. Um, like in the, the previous case study where the professors were, were more or less non-existent, didn't contribute to classes, I, I think that, that helps a lot. Um, the, other cla- oh, the other question, setting up discussion groups with large classes. Um, I think a lot of like MMO, like massive, uh, multiplayer online video games, 
they have various servers or portals that players log on to. I, I think you could just set up like three or four different portals that the students can log on to, and, uh, and they, they each have a, a different group each week. Um, I'm, I'm sure there will be some students who will repeatedly click the same portal, but without a, a playable character that they're they're invested in, I think most of them will kind of wander around. And uh, I mean, you can you can lock it with a certain number of people go into the room, and they're going to be able to comment. But you maybe you can still have it open that the other students can go in and and read what's going on in the classrooms. So they maybe they'll bring that conversation over into their their portal. Uh, I think that's a not a bad idea. You, you could even make them so that their uh, groups with similar time schedules that they might actually be able to meet through Zoom or some other program where they can see face to face and have like a little mini class. I know uh, some friends through churches are doing online cell groups where they're they're still ha instead instead of going to people's houses and, and studying, they're they're just doing it online so they can still get that community feel to it. And uh, I know everybody's not on the same schedule, so if you have such a large class like that, it gives people the opportunity to find groups who are like available in the mornings for it or in the evenings or in the middle of the day. So and why not? We're all in isolation right now. <laughs> not well. Not, quarantine but whatever so seeing people every once in a while might not be a bad thing those are those are my ideas hi my name is tony DeMeo. i am a ta at the high school level in the special education department where i work in various subjects usually in all inclusion classrooms so the first um issue clara presented was how to promote more online interactions among students beyond the question to keep a conversation going well I think it's hard actually to have a conversation in an online forum because it's not really natural. It's not like a face-to-face -face conversation, how that would naturally flow. So I would recommend that after the main question or uh, response to the question is created, I think it would be engaging for students to write a personal question or a personal comment that they obtained from the reading and then have um, each other in the course comment on their peers' personal questions and personal comments. I always feel that students, regardless of the level, this being graduate school level, we're always more engaged when we can connect material to our lives and even related to maybe some things that others in the course have in common that they wouldn't know unless a um, personal question or personal comment was asked. And I think this way it sparks others to comment on something more than just a response to the reading, which I then, which then I, I would think would make conversation flow more deep and longer than just responding to material that was read. Um, the second issue you presented was how to ensure all the students are doing their work in their groups and how to have it where you don't have to read as many responses because there are so many students in your class. I would recommend that you have your students leave no more than a four minute weekly audio post and no more than a paragraph for uh, weekly written responses. Um, and then I think to ensure that students are actually working together, you could create a shared Google document with them and you can actually uh, create a check-in uh, for each group member and you can see when they check in and then you can also have each group member state what they did in the activity so this way you not only see that students checked in but you see which students actually did what and then your third issue was um, how do we keep the conversation alive during this time of digital learning. So I'm directly impacted by this. And like I mentioned, I work as a TA in the special education department at the high school level. So during this time of digital learning, uh, certain TAs have been assigned to certain um, courses, if you will. So I was assigned to English 11 inclusion. And um, here I work with a few special education students who I know and have worked with before this, um, before this happened. So uh, we all created a shared Google document where I can see and provide descriptive feedback to their work. But we also meet every day at 1.30 on Google Hangouts. 
and we work together on assignments that I modify from the general education teacher. And me and my students, we work together as if we would work together in person. And um, I see their Google documents up on the screen along with their faces while we talk and work together for our 130 Google Meets as if it was in class. And then um, connecting the case study questions um, to the course, I would actually relate it to this week's reading on gaining clarity on your goals, chapter three, because it really allowed me to understand what was meant by asking essential questions, which is really asking questions that are answerable. Um, I think this uh, reading also promoted the idea of keeping students engaged um, and on task and not feeling overwhelmed by assignments or sometimes the questions that are posed in assignments because the reading really showed how to keep your questions to the point, straightforward, and answerable. Um, and actually, your conversation before the case study um, reminded me of the, uh, the week we read The Brain, Chapter 5, Mind and Brain, because um, it really shows that the more you learn something, the more you train your brain how to do something, whether it's learning a new language or learning how to work and implement technology better, both as a teacher and student. Practice does make perfect, and that was really the point of that reading. Hi, my name is Richie Tarantola, and I'm a graduate student in Dolphin University's Educational Technology Program. I'm currently a music teacher at Maspeth High School, and I've been teaching in the New York City Department of Education for four years. The podcast with Clara Bauer presented two main problems, the first of which is more general, addresses generating authentic interactions emulating a conversation, the second of which is more specific, which deals with providing best practices on managing a larger class discussion and making sure students are receiving something worthwhile. In reference to the conversation prior to the case studies, these problems are now wide stream in K-12 school systems and districts, with the big change to learning remotely. To address the first problem, I would give students specific guidelines and stipulations in conjunction with various options to achieve these authentic interactions. Most importantly, even before having a good overarching question discussion question, is the environment itself. One of the biggest challenges many online courses face is that they lack a personal element, and this stems from the instructor. Whether you're spending time making a presence through weekly videos, Zoom extra help sessions, or even giving light to your personal goals, learning, etc., you shouldn't be thinking about time spent. Um, this time will either be spent in planning or trying to figure out solutions to re-engage your students later on. Like a traditional classroom, procedures and expectations from the start will shape the way a classroom will run. Something that can aid production is a requirement and how it affects their grade. At the college level and even in high school, some students are in a class because they have to, and some are enrolled because of peer interest. Playing with the effect of an assignment has helped me have students take some tasks more seriously than others. If your semesterly goal is to prove engagement and authenticity in discussions, make professionalism, or whatever corresponding category that is, more of a percentage out of their grade. An assignment will always be an assignment. However, if there is an outside influence and motivation, maybe it will trigger intrinsic motivation. Secondly, the addition of various options for credit will influence a discussion's relevance in the eyes of a student. When we covered universal design, the guidelines for purposeful, motivated learners really stuck with me. Meyer, Rosen, Gordon highlighted that providing options will optimize relevance authenticity, and value. Some of these options could look like a real-time podcast, Google Doc, virtual hours, and other things that stem away from the traditional written statement. In regards to value, one thing that I've learned during this quarantine period is time. One mandate that my school has done that has in turn improved my own personal productivity is a required office hour. Yes, the benefits of taking an online class is the ability to put in the work whenever you can. However, students of all ages need some form of structure. In knowing that I have this hour or hours to dedicate to my work, there is an organization and motivation that to be productive, to be as productive as I can. If you're working with specific groups, you could share or post the office hour of your partner or partners to aid in collaboration. Again, my suggested solutions consist of creating an environment that is conducive to the productivity you desire, setting guidelines and stipulations in conjunction with options for submission. As the second issue of managing a larger class and keeping things productive, the keys really lie in modeling and student leadership through various roles. 
And being a music teacher, I've had classes as big as 51 students with instruments. Woof. The, these, uh, the methods that I found successful is modeling with my expectations through various mediums and giving students roles. This cannot be done without consistent assessments and appropriate feedback. If you want groups to produce a podcast through discussion, then show them the trials and tribulations of one that you found successful. Based on your assessments, you can align roles that will benefit the entire group and individual students. I typically assign sectionals with a section leader who will run their portion of that rehearsal, a timekeeper, and a recorder. My role is to be the facilitator and assess productivity and quality. These roles switch based on recent assessments and groupings. After the allotted time has passed, we reconfigure as a large ensemble, perform the given task, and then reflect. Lastly, these discussions, big or small, must have relevance and value to warrant authenticity. To recap, my suggestions are to build an authentic environment with clear expectations in conjunction with options for credit. Hi, I am Nida Mushtaq Khan. I am a graduate student at Adelphi University and my major is Educational Technology. After listening to the podcast, the conversation I have come to think of several problems that are integration of technology in our education system, the reluctance shown by international students uh, regarding technology, and how do we handle different large classes. Other than that, the problem which was shown by the professor's co-host, uh, that is there, are, there is a, large, a lot of homework which has been sent nowadays in this coronavirus scenario and how to deal with it. Other than that, uh, there is there was a question generated by the co-host or professor that how uh, how do we generate uh, good questions and, and how can we engage students in different um, discussions, healthy discussions, uh, activities. First of all, the solutions which I find for the integration of technology in our education system is that it is important and it should be incorporated in our uh, in our uh, education system and the management should make it sure. Other than that, there is a problem of finances as well. Uh, we must uh, get uh, more and more funds and government sh- should pay uh, attention towards this thing. Other than that, uh, we, we must have more and more teachers and we must make teachers uh, go hand in hand with technology so that we may have advanced kind of knowledge. Uh, Secondly, the reluctance which has been shown by international students uh, to use technology, uh, it it can have several uh, reasons and teachers must get to know about them as well because uh, it is the level of interest also which is not only which is the problem with, with not only international students, it's the problem of locals as well because uh, they are always using phones, their different gadgets, iPads, their laptops, and they are always uh, involved in fine activities. But when it comes to uh, education and when they have to use it uh, regarding education, they feel it a burden. So uh, it's the responsibility of teachers. How do they create uh, the interest of students to get involved in technology. So there can be different possible means for that. For example, there can be different a number of activities which can keep them busy and which can uh, create develop the interest of students in uh, different uh, technological activities. Other than that, uh, there is also a problem that students who have come from different backgrounds, uh, they may have come from an area where uh, technology is not that much rampant and they don't, they don't know how to use technology actually. So this can be a major problem as well. So uh, other than that, how to handle large classes? Uh, It's the responsibility of management that they must keep a few students in one classroom so that teachers may handle them well and they may come to know about the problems of students and they may uh, learn to know how to um, come across the variability of learners and how they can uh, empathize them uh, with them. Here I would like to uh, uh, quote the example of a person from uh, Expert Learning Reading by Mayor Rosen Jordan. Uh, it's Rick Burnbaum, the way he used to empathize with his students and his people. Uh, he says that I understood them and they understood me. I helped them figure out how to use what they were good at. I was also giving them uh, the one thing they really needed. Someone who was emotionally involved, I let them know I was going to be part of their solution. Uh, this uh, quotation is present on page number 36 uh, of Expert Learning, learning Reading. Uh, other than that, uh, the homework which is being sent to people uh, and uh, students nowadays, it's quite extensive and they are not involved in interactive sessions. Uh, it should be ensured that the understanding of people is important and for to develop that understanding, they must uh, uh, teachers must consider the preconceptions, uh, foundations of factual knowledge and metacognitive approach of people in mind and they must arrange activities in such a way that they are keeping in view all these three aspects uh, which is present in the in the paradigm lost 
reading and uh, after reading that it, uh, one must come to know that all these three uh, things are important and other than that i would like to uh, focus on the six facets of understanding as well that the uh, importance of uh, these uh, facets should be kept in view that the understanding of students is important uh, digital maximalism is quite rampant nowadays and it should be kept in view and there must be kept a balance that uh, students use technology and uh, they are uh, busy in um, technology in a productive way that they are not misusing it other than that the last question which was raised that how to generate a good question and professor uh, aaron has answered it quite well that he provides guidelines for that i would like to quote the example of aha moment here the way he uh, provides different guidelines for that platform it's quite amazing uh, so i would like to appreciate the um, um, podcast as well and i uh, i am happy the way it has been um, presented to students and uh, the way it has uh, uh, talked about different case studies and um, how the importance of technology has been raised and has been focused it's important uh, i would like to um, add some uh, suggestions as well that in order to uh, develop the interest of students uh, a teacher must follow the approach of tpck framework framework as well and different models like samr model and uh, different techniques like udl technique and uh, uh, theories and uh, things like that they can be used and uh, teachers must be familiar with the uh, background of students and they must create such activities and such platforms which are interesting for students and they must learn to know how students are going to interact and how they are going to respond to different activities Hi, this is John Chevalier. Um, I'm in my final semester as a grad student for adolescent education um, in social studies. Um, so what I think the main issue was that the teacher was um, trying to incorporate different ways to enhance um, student discussions um, instead of just um, discussion boards and just having students um, respond to other students' um, questions or answers or um, vice versa. Um, so I think that's what one of the main issues um, that Clara was trying to distinguish in her classrooms right now. And I think right now we're in like a great opportunity to really test new technologies in this environment because of the situation we are in. And I know one great opportunity we can use is Zoom which has giving the which gives the ability to break out into separate rooms per se um, hypothetical rooms um, and those rooms can separate groups so you can get different groups together um, and then talk as a class set everything up and then break into those groups and maybe do um, a jigsaw kind of thing where you get a couple documents or a couple other um, journal articles that each student reads and they got to take a couple notes and then explain it to the students so then everybody's engaging and interacting um, so then you can use Google Classroom to get those documents out set the groups up get the zoom going and have everybody together um, and I think this is a an exciting time too that we can see this going on in high school classrooms possibly in college classrooms right now where we're seeing these zoom classrooms and these zoom breakouts and we can have these small meaningful conversations even though we're quarantined and separated from each other so i think this is kind of a perfect time to use that um and i think to um to make connections to the relevant readings um is for the um i believe it was in the udl yes udl um one of the ways um, the teachers can help themselves in engaging and reaching all learners to give a student a role in teaching. Um, the UDL guidelines emphasize the importance of fostering, um, importance. Um, you know, cooperation can also boost opportunities for sustained engagement. Groupings of students allow better differentiation in multiple roles. So like I was saying, we can give separate different roles in those jigsaw groups. We can have like a, a leader or a mentor or someone in that role, in that group leading the discussion as the mentor or the, the teacher per se in that group. So they kind of take turns um, moving around as the, um, the leader of that class. Um, also, I, I wanted to bring up to we just even though we just talked about is the um, essential questions. So in social studies, uh, um, 
for me, one thing that you could do, say like we're talking about Teddy Roosevelt, you can talk about Teddy Roosevelt on the Panama Canal and if it was a good thing or was it a bad thing or um, specifically um, one sec, um, justifying his actions, sorry about justifying his actions in Panama. Um, so give them a historical context in that background and give them actual documents from that time period so they can go through that um, and jigsaw that out as well and come back together. Um, and like I said, I think this is a great time for us to experiment with these opportunities that we're given to stay home and either use Google Chats or Zoom or find other outlets to really incorporate technology into our learning um, environment and bridge the gap from being separated to helping these students, especially these high school seniors, juniors that are getting ready off to go to college, hopefully next year, um, that kind of have that separation from home and kind of the same thing going on so right now um i'm going to cut it off now so i don't go over that five minutes but um uh, thank you hi this is Alyssa persick i am a graduate student at adelphi studying mathematics education so in this podcast you and professor bowler addressed two problems in her class both of them were concerned with online class discussions the first problem had to do with engaging and encouraging students to participate while the other was concerned with managing discussions in larger classes and still keeping everyone involved. Uh, The first problem, which I think is common in online class forums and discussions, is that oftentimes professors will pose a question and the student will respond and then just be done with the post and not continue to engage with it. The students are more concerned with just completing the assignment than actually discussing it everything about it. I have come up with some possible solutions that I think could help to promote interaction in your class. I was wondering each week if you just pose one good question or multiple questions. I think maybe offering multiple prompts for students to reflect on may help engage more students because they can kind of pick uh, which questions they relate with the most. Um, In class, specifically in the Meyer, Rose, and Gordon reading on Universal Design for Learning, two big components of the UDL are providing options for recruiting interest and providing options of expression and communication. We constantly uh, discuss the importance of providing students with choices um, to help engage them better. They should be able to pick what fits best for them. So if you provide them with options, they can pick the one or a couple of them that stand out to them or asking them questions that actually personally reflect on the topic. Although it is an online class and face-to-face meetings are not necessary um, or required, I think a tool like Zoom is sometimes like helpful when you aren't getting that in- uh, engagement that you're looking for in interaction. Um, Because that discussion element where students have to actually interact um, may be beneficial. Or another option may be to use a tool like VoiceThread like we use in class. I'm not sure how your students have to respond to these questions, but allowing them with multiple mediums such as like a written, a voice, or a video option could also get students to interact more. Some students might be more shy than others, so speaking may be intimidating at times. Um, In our class, we have to post our responses and then reply to a certain number of students each week. While this doesn't necessarily completely like eliminate the fact that they could just reply once and move on and actually have a discussion, it does help to have students build off each other's ideas and potentially get a conversation going because they do have to listen to what their peers say and respond. For your other class, I know discussions in larger classes can sometimes be difficult and hard to manage because you can't always just have one big discussion and still hear everyone. Uh, For one of my classes, though, a similar size, maybe a little smaller, my professor will often just go around the room. This was prior to going online, but still on our online setting, we do the same thing and ask us briefly to share our opinions on the readings or like we could even go off of what someone else said. So while this is not necessarily convenient every week, it is nice to occasionally hear from everyone all at the same time. I think one way, like you said, to split up the students into groups and constantly switch them up would be helpful. Um, For example, you could do a Socratic or fishbowl style discussion over Zoom where one group talks and discusses, say, the reading, while the other outside group just observes and takes note take notes and then afterwards they can go back and either share those notes during the same discussion and like share points that were made or you could have them post say like a reflection if they were not participating in the discussion that week um and then you can change and then the next week another group talks and then after every couple weeks once everyone's talked you can switch these groups up so they're not
not speaking with the same people. This way you hear from everyone at some point, but for, for some students that are more shy, for, per se, um, there's not the pressure to have to discuss every week and they're more inclined to participate in some way. And varies the type of discussion so they're not doing the same thing every week and they're not having to talk or some weeks they're writing or something like that. I hope these ideas are helpful and help improve your discussions. Thank you. So those are the student responses. I want to thank the students of the Technology and Instructional Design class for taking the time to listen to last week's episode and for responding. Clara and I will be listening to these together and finding a way to respond to you. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.